I'm going to talk to you today about why Satan counterfeits the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to be covering five different points here after we talk about why Satan counterfeits the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you the proof that he does. But point number one to support this, can Satan enter into a man? The Holy Spirit can enter into a man. Can, can Satan do the same thing? I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about that. Number two, I'm going to prove to you that the devil spirit, the spirit of Satan, indwells the Antichrist. I'm going to show you the proof. Number three, has Satan ever controlled other political rulers? If number two is true, that he indwells the, his spirit indwells the, the uh, Antichrist, has he ever done it in the past with other political rulers? I'm going to be showing you the scriptures. Number four, we're going to identify the members of the Satanic Trinity. Who is the Father? Who is the Son? Who is the Spirit? I'm going to show you that. Kind of a part two of the other study I did on the Satanic Trinity, showing you that, yes, there is a Satanic Trinity, the concept of gods, but they're only one God. Three different persons, but they're only one person, or one being, we'll say. I'm going to show you, you know, some more on that, the identity of Father, Son, and Spirit. And number five... I'm going to prove to you that the Holy Spirit is not a dove in your King James Bible. And I'm going to show you where the teaching came from. And I'll give you a little hint. Catholicism. Okay, And I'm going to show you the proof. I'm going to show you from their official teaching. From their Bible, the Reims 1582 translation, an exact copy of it. And I'm going to show you from their catechism and from their official documents. That yes, they are the ones that you know, taught this thing of the Holy Spirit is a dove. I'm going to show you, and I want to show you a really bizarre teaching, okay? This fifth point here, I'm going to just touch on briefly in this video, and then we're going to do a second video where my wife will be joining me and helping me with a lot of these quotes. So, going to be a really detailed study today. But let's start out here, why Satan counterfeits the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you the proof. Turn in your King James Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened means you're made alive. You're like a, a, an electronic item that has no batteries in it when you're lost. When the Lord saves you and his Holy Spirit comes in, you are quickened. You are made alive before you're dead in trespasses and sins. That's why lost people can't understand a lot of this stuff. Verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world... According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Okay? Let me just erase this stuff up here. We need to look at some things here. I'll erase everything but the title there. Now, we just noticed two things there. We noticed number one the prince of the power of the air. Of the air. Air is your key word. Okay? Secondly, you, the, the beautiful thing about the King James Bible, and this is a majorly huge, big study, a lot of times it will define it. It'll say a statement, and it'll say, comma, the whatever, and it'll define it. So you have the prince of the power of the air, the spirit. I'll put it in all capital letters. It's not in all capital letters in our text, but I'm trying to make an emphasis here. The spirit there. Sorry about that. That now worketh. in the children of disobedience. So we see there a tie-in between this prince and this spirit. Okay? Very, very important there. This prince is connected to air and he is a Spirit. All right. 
Now, I don't often refer to Hebrew and Greek and whatever else because then people think that that's the authority and not the English. The English has every bit as much authority as the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay, the Lord has proved that over the centuries, as long as you have a King James Bible. But the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, where we get our word pneumatic. If you have a pneumatic drill, a pneumatic whatever, pneumatic means it's air driven. Okay, that's where the word spirit comes from. Spirit, air. This prince is connected with air and spirit. Hmm. Why Satan counterfeits the Holy Spirit? Does Satan counterfeit him? Right there. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Yes, Satan does counterfeit the Holy Spirit of God. Absolutely. And let me show you another tie-in with this. Go to Job chapter 41. You know what the key sin is with uh, children of disobedience? Why does a child disobey a parent? One word. Go to Job chapter 41. I'll show you here in a minute when I get there in my Bible. Job chapter 41. There's one thing that will lead a child to disobey their parents. You know what it is? P R I D E. Pride. That's why a child disobeys their parents because they have pride. I know better than my dad and mom. I know better. I don't have to listen. I can make my own rules. Pride. You say, what's the big deal about that? Let's look here. Job chapter 41, verse 34. The whole chapter is about this, this uh, creature named Leviathan. And you do the, the comparison there. It's talking, about, it's talking about a real you know, creature from the past, but it compares it to Satan. Satan is a red dragon, great red dragon in Revelation chapter 12. And this Leviathan creature is a dragon. Very simple. But look at... Uh, uh, verse, what are we got here? 34. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Huh. He beholdeth all high things. It's not just some dragon that lives in the sea or whatever else. It's extinct now. We're talking about a spiritual being. The Lord is showing the devil to Job. He's saying, there, look at him. Let me explain some things about this great red dragon, this Leviathan. He is a king over all the children of pride. He's a prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And he's a king over those children of pride. They disobey because of their pride. Hmm, pretty interesting. Turn next to 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll see more about this thing of the children of the devil and it has nothing to do with some serpent seed doctrine that the devil you know had a fornicative you know relationship with with uh, Eve in the garden and, and then that you know came and they came down through and the, the children that are produced there they're all that you know the seed of Satan or something that stuff is nonsense don't fall for that a lot of people have repeated it and it's just stupid okay uh, for many reasons. I'm not even going to get into it all here. But 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. That doesn't mean you don't like the political rulers or whatever else. It just means you're, you don't want to be governed and whatever. Um, and, it, and there is a sense there of, of you know, God-appointed authorities in actual governmental positions. So don't get that. It's not that it excludes, you know, anybody in government, but it's, again, another study could be said on that. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So you do have the thing of dig dig dignities there compared to Rev uh, Romans chapter 13. If you want to do the study. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. 
But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Sin is one of the, the uh, best ways to get back at somebody. If you want to get revenge at some wicked person out there, just let them continue in their sin. Okay, sin is self-destructive. Verse 13, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. What's it talking about? It's talking about the same thing. Children of disobedience. King over all the children of pride. Here they're called cursed children. And you compare these three different accounts, it's talking about the same people. Those people that have Satan as their father. Satan as their king. Okay? Remember that. Verse 15, Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the mad madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. I mean, I could do a whole study just on these verses here about false converts, false religious converts. Um, they are children of disobedience, children of pride. They are, here it says uh, there in verse 14, cursed children. Absolutely. But look at verse 20. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. There's a whole lot of people that literally say that salvation, the gospel, is knowledge. You believe. Do you believe? Do you have faith alone? That's all that salvation is to these people. What are they? Children of disobedience, children of pride, cursed children. Satan is their king. Pretty incredible. Verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Remember the sow for later, okay? Another word for pig or swine. Remember that for later. That'll be important. So, what do we see? Three different references to children of this prince of the power of the air, the king over all the children of pride. We have disobedience, pride, and cursed children. All right? So, does Satan counterfeit the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. He has a spirit about him. All right? And again, a lot of people just say, oh yeah, prince of the power of the air. Well, that means he's, he controls television and radio and whatever else. He's into that whole thing because that goes through the airwaves. Oh, uh, no, it's a lot more than that. The devil imitates the Holy Spirit. He is a spirit, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Please remember that. When you have a call out there that's making a big deal about the spirit of God, we want the spirit of God to come down and there's all these manifestations of the spirit and they're doing things and you say, wait a second here. Uh, crawling around on the floor barking like a dog. Um, where's that at in Scripture? Uh, shaking and twitching and stuff. Where's that at in Scripture? Where's that at in Scripture? It's not there. There's no such thing as a, as a tongue where you just babble. An unknown tongue means simply that nobody there understands it. It's a language. It's some kind of a language. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that there's supposed to be an interpret, you know, somebody that, that can interpret that tongue. But in Acts chapter 2, all the tongues are given as known languages. In your King James Bible, there's no such thing as a, as a babble, babble tongue um, that comes from a spirit. A spirit that comes from the prince of the power of the air. Hmm. 
So all these manifestations of the Holy Spirit, yelling, screaming, falling down, rolling around on the floor, all you got to do, friend, is just look it up in your Bible and say, wait a second, looking through the book of Acts, it's not there. Uh-oh. Could it be that it's from another spirit? A spirit that comes as a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit? Yes. But now we have to ask the question, can Satan enter into a man? We'll go there next. Let me erase this. Had a good comment. Somebody said, why don't, why don't you just erase things when you're done with it? And that way you don't have all the stuff just crammed, you know, the whole sermon crammed into one thing there. Good suggestion. I agree. I like to learn from the people that comment in the down below. I do learn from you. I'm not too prideful to, to admit to being wrong and to say, hey, you know what? That's a good idea. I was doing it wrong. But let's let's look into the thing of can Satan enter into somebody? Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We've seen that he can counterfeit the Holy Spirit. That's clearly there. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of dis disobedience. So Satan can manifest himself as a spirit, but can he indwell somebody? Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Talking about Jesus. They want to kill Jesus. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Satan entered into him. Another passage that talks about Satan entering into him. And Jesus says, here he gives, you know, the one, he gives uh, Judas Iscariot the sop. Interesting because the name, one of the names of the Antichrist in the future is Son of Perdition, S-O-P. Interesting little tie in there. But let's go back to Luke chapter 8. And your King James Bible has something very, very unique in it. It has the devil, proper name there, meaning Satan. You can read Revelation chapter 12 that talks about that old serpent, you know, the, the devil and Satan. Okay, it's, it's one being. It's not, there's the devil and then you have Satan. Over here. No, it's the devil. And, but you have the devil and then you have lowercase devils. Right, there are other spirits that will follow Satan and do his bidding. Satan is not omnipresent. He's not able to be in more than one person at a time. But his devils can also infest the bodies of other people. I'll show you the proof of that. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And he, when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Okay, did he say anything wrong? No, he didn't. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? You go into a charismatic church and you see some guy saying, Jesus is the Son of God, most high. People would say, praise the Lord, a spirit-filled Christian. Well, you're right, he is spirit-filled, but it's devil spirits. Watch out for that. Verse 29, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times, oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and, the, and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Hmm. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Many devils were entered into him? Yeah. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there and heard of many swine. What did we read over in 2 Peter chapter 2? The sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Hmm. Many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Um... Verse 34, when they that fled 
fed them, saw what was done, they fled and went in and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were really happy about it. They said, this is great. This, it doesn't say that. They were afraid. What? <laughs> Isn't that something amazing about lost people? Here you get some guy who's, who's running around naked, cutting himself and things, living out in the tombs, and he's a, just a crazy nut, screaming and yelling and, ah, and whatever. And the people just go, oh, that's a crazy old so-and-so. And the guy gets saved, cleaned up. Well, I shouldn't say saved, but he's, you know, the devil's cast out of him, and he's sitting there in his right mind. And the people go, ugh. Do you ever experience that as a Christian? Back when you were lost and messed up and into all kinds of wicked things and whatever else, people liked you. And then you get saved and you start walking around and you carry a King James Bible in some place and people, oh, they get scared of you. Weird, isn't it? They'd rather be around uh, devil spirits. You know why? Uh, probably because they're under the power of the prince of the air. Um, their children of disobedience, cursed children, their king, you know, they are the children of pride. That's probably why they like the devil spirits a little bit more than you as a Christian. But again, do we see this thing of the devil imitating the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit moves into you as a Christian. Your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. As a lost person, the devils can come in to somebody, enter into a body. Yes. Go to 2 John. Back towards the back part of your Bible there, Second John. <clears throat> Only one chapter. So go to verse 7. And you'll see this, this peculiar wording of entered into. All right? Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. The devils entered into the man that had many devils. Okay? But look at this. What is one of the jobs of a devil? They deceive people. They're liars. 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Ooh. Okay. Get a hold of this one. A devil, a devil... Say it this way, enters into someone, a man. I'll just draw a stick figure like that. And the way that you can tell is they don't confess. Don't. I oh, should put don't up there. Don't confess that. I'll shorten it here a little bit. Jesus, and here's the key word, is, very important, come in the flesh. Okay? And what do you have? When you meet this situation, a devil enters into a man, and they don't confess that Jesus is come in the flesh. You have an anti-Christ right there. Very important to understand that. And we're going to see that later. Again, as we tie this thing into the Antichrist that's coming. See again, what do we have? You have a devil or also called, we'll say it this way, the devil, right there, and devils, in the plural. Okay, you understand? Antichrist and antichrists, in the plural. Let me re redo this one here, lowercase d. One singular here, the devil, and plural, 
devils. There will come a, a time, a day in the future, when you have the Antichrist as a man, the son of perdition, but there are already Antichrists, people who are cursed children. They say a lot of nice things. They, they look good and whatever else, but all it is is a head knowledge. So you can get a head knowledge and say all kinds of things to deceive people. Okay, That's all throughout the world. I could give so many hundreds of examples of people who have a head knowledge, but there's no heartfelt conviction there. There's no changed life and whatever else. Um, you get a lot of guys that'll, that'll tell a woman the right things to fornicate with her. So I love you, baby, and everything else. They don't love them. They don't love them for one second. They're lying, you see. Just like over here. Well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, and I, I also does Jesus Christ. Is, do you believe that Jesus Christ comes, or you know, that He is in the flesh? Has Jesus, you know, does, do you confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh? No, I believe that He has come in the flesh. Has and is is the same thing. It's interchangeable. No, it's not. No, it is not. Let me show you another verse that ties into this whole thing. Did a video on this a while back, and and a lot of. There weren't too many people that were able to, to uh, go through this. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Because this really pins them that they have a spirit of Antichrist. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Hmm. But try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. Many deceivers are entered into the world. Verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth, confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where ye have, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Think about what you're reading. Ye have heard that it should come, but even now it's already in the world. Many deceivers are entered into the world. Hmm. How about that? You say, what's the importance? I don't understand. Is or has? What's the big deal? Well, is is something that you say about somebody who is there throughout all of eternity. He is in the past. He is alive today. He is going to be in the flesh. Say it this way. He is in the flesh in the Old Testament. He is in the flesh in the New Testament. He is in the flesh today. And He is coming in the flesh in the future. What's a has? Well, if you're a has-been, you know, Hitler has come in the flesh. Is he in the flesh right now? No. George Washington has come in the flesh. Is he in the flesh right now? No. I believe that, Jesus, or that, that George Washington is come in the flesh. Well, you're crazy in the head. He doesn't have flesh right now. He's, he's worm food. Okay? He has come in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's the distinction there. Somebody can't confess that? They're an antichrist. Simple. Well, no, you see, no, 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 no. Simple. Very simple. Continuing, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is he that is in the world? Well, that would be the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. See how it lines all up here? We are of God. He that knoweth God, um, he that he that, excuse me, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Two different spirits? You mean to tell me that there's two different spirits out there? One that is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then there's a spirit of error. Satan, the devil, and his children are the Antichrists. I mean, it, it, the Bible is, is so complex and yet so simple at the same time. It's such an amazing book. You know, People are one day going to worship the Antichrist. Why? Because they are 
Antichrist. So simple. Very profound, but yet so simple. It's amazing. I want to worship the Antichrist. Why? Because he appeals to me. Jesus does not appeal to the average person. You see? That's what they say. Very interesting. But now let me show you the proof that the spirit of Satan will indwell the Antichrist in the future. I'll show you the proof of that. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 4. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Hmm. The name. Interesting. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? No, uh, okay. I love the King James Bible, but there's clearly an error here, okay? Because it says there in verse 4, they worship the beast, excuse me, they worship the dragon, and they worship the beast. And they say, who is like unto the beast? You mean to tell me they would worship two separate persons, and you just say one name? Hmm. They worship the dragon, and yet they worship the beast. Very interesting. How are they doing that? Because the dragon is the spirit that indwells the beast. Let's look at four things here. What does the dragon give the beast? Okay, the dragon gives the beast four things. Number one, his power. Did you ever hear of a uh, charismatic, one of these charismatic nuts? They talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Boy, the power is mighty on this guy. I pray the power of the Holy Spirit. What are they doing? I remember seeing this one. Uh, they're putting the Satan, the spirit of Satan into these people. Devil spirits into these people. I remember seeing, uh, what was the one guy... I keep thinking of Rodney Dangerfield, but that was an actor, comedy guy. <laughs> uh, there was some charismaniac faith healer guy. I uh, can't think of what the guy's name was, but I remember he's, he's going around and he's whacking people on the head and whatever, and there's a man standing there praying, and he says, don't pray, don't pray, don't pray. Stop praying, stop praying. Do that at home. Stop praying. Uh, why is he trying to do that? Because he doesn't want the guy to block him putting devils into people. Okay? I've said for many, many years now, you look at the, the last Reformation, this Torben Sundergaard idiot and, and some of these other guys and they're casting devils out of people and when the devil's cast out you see them yelling and screaming and acting like nuts and whatever uh, it's not that they're casting out it's not exorcism it's actually impartation they're putting devil spirits in to these people at these charismatic revivals that's why they're doing things that don't appear in the bible okay that's what they're doing devils are entering into these people and then the people become antichrists uh, again, talk to a charismatic. Talk to them. Try to show them some doctrine from the Bible. They'll get angry at you. They hate the pure doctrines of the King James Bible. They can't stand them. Hmm. The devil, the other thing the devil gives him, gives the Antichrist, is his seat. Oh boy. You know the devil has a seat? The devil likes to sit on a throne. He likes to be worshipped. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. Take a break here from Revelation 13. We'll come back to it. But uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, says here, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 
I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Huh. I thought Satan had a throne down in hell. Uh, Satan's not been to hell. He doesn't want to go to hell. Okay, he gets cast there in the future, after the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ on the earth. He hasn't been down to hell. He doesn't live down there and rule down there. That's, that's Jack Chick stuff. That's, that's just nonsense. And, and Jack Chick should know better than this stuff, too, by the way. And a lot of these other guys, they draw Satan sitting down there, and he's, he's on his throne, you know, and there's flames coming up behind it. That is nonsense. There's not one verse of Scripture to prove that. Satan's seat is on the earth. Continue reading. And thou hast hold, excuse me, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Was Antipas in hell? No. Was Antipas did he go up to heaven and get killed up there? No. Where is Satan dwelling? Where is his seat? In Pergamos, on the earth. You see, the devil has a throne. Why? Because Satan enters into certain people that control things in this world. That's why the Bible, when it talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not saying that flesh and blood people aren't used of the devil. It's simply saying they don't have the brains to come up with these world you know, conquering type of schemes and whatever else. It's Satan and his devils that are controlling these people. He enters into them, into the children of disobedience, the children of pride, the cursed children. Satan, excuse me, Satan and his devils enter into them. Next we have, go back to Revelation 13. Need to get back there in my Bible. Revelation chapter 13. Next we have the, the next thing that the devil gives. The dragon gives to the beast. Great authority. Jesus is out in the wilderness and the devil says, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you what? The kingdoms. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world is the dragon, Satan. He has great authority. His seat is not just some kind of a thing of, it's a nice lazy boy recliner in a nice little cabin in the middle of nowhere. No, his seat is a throne. And he rules from that throne. And politicians come and they bow down before the man who Satan has entered into. Say, who's that? Uh, Donald Trump? No. Trump is one of the ones that goes and bows down. The Pope. Very clearly, the Pope. I mean, May of this year, uh, all the world's leaders and things are supposed to be summoned to Rome to go and talk about world peace and this little peace summit or something like this. I heard about. Who else does that? What other leader, what other politician, what other religious guy or whatever else has a throne in a city that people come and bow down to him and take orders from him? Hmm. Oh, they don't take orders. You know, the Pope is just there as a kind of a, a figurehead of Christ's church on earth. You're quite ignorant. What's the other thing that the devil gives to the Antichrist? Number four, a mouth speaking great things. You say, give me an example in history. Hitler. Was Hitler a mighty orator? Yes. Look at how, watch, a, watch a, a video sometime of Adolf Hitler speaking to the crowds out there and stuff. And he's, he's you know, all riled up and everything else. And he's, he's yelling and he's, and he's hollering and things. He was a great orator. And you watch the people out in the crowd there. And he gets done and, and they're, Sig Heil! Sig Heil! And they're going like this. And just brainless. 
Don't tell me it was because Hitler had a natural talent and, and, and he was an artist and he kind of applied. The, no, no, no. He had a spirit. He had a spirit that gave him power. Didn't give him his seat necessarily, but he gave him great authority and a mouth speaking great things. And the ultimate manifestation of that is going to be the Antichrist in the future. Oh, uh, have you heard Billy Graham preach? Boy, that guy, he had the Holy Spirit upon him. Boy, the spirit that just worked that guy, he could just control thousands of people. Wasn't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead people into lies and deception like Billy Graham preached. Somebody comes out and says, oh, Billy Graham, I, I don't know. You know I, I, he had some issues, but I think, boy, he had the Holy Spirit. You are deceived. Or a deceiver. Another spirit's entered into you. Um, Billy Graham didn't have the Holy Spirit. He had a devil spirit. And the Antichrist is going to be even more charismatic than Hitler, Billy Graham, any of them. He's going to be given these four things according to what we just read in Revelation 13. But now let's ask a question. Has Satan ever controlled other political rulers? So you can say what you want. You can say, oh, Denlinger's a nut. Yeah, well, join the crowd. Take a number. I'll get to you eventually. Probably not. There's too many people waiting in line. <laughs> but uh, you can say whatever you want about me, but the fact of the matter is the Bible plainly teaches what I'm saying in this study here. The devil does control politicians and leaders and things like that, and devil spirits do as well, uh, control a lot of people. But uh, there are historical examples in your King James Bible where the devil controlled political leaders and to the point of actually being almost synonymous with that political leader. Let me show you. First, go back to the book of Daniel. Back to your Old Testament. Daniel chapter 10. Beginning in verse 13. Here you have Daniel and, and basically this angel comes to him and he's speaking to him. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael the archangel in context here, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days? Hmm. Jump down to uh, verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou whether... Wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. The Lord there, the angel of the Lord there, basically is saying about he's going and he's, he's going to fight with these different political rulers. Is that really a fair fight? <laughs> you know, an angel of the Lord and he's, and he's going and he's saying, I'm going to fight with this political ruler. Who's he really fighting with? Satan. Hmm. I'll show you another example. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. The book that comes right before the book of Daniel. Ezekiel 28 verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Again another prince. Prince of the power of the air. Hmm. <clears throat> the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Interesting. Thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast or thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God. Huh. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Wait a second. There's a prince, he's sitting in a seat, and he's saying, I am God. Hmm. The Antichrist, the son of perdition, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You think there's a tie-in? Verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Whoever this uh, prince is here, he's wiser than Daniel. Hmm. 
With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee and the, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Remember that, being brought down to the pit. <clears throat> wilt, thou say, wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Huh. So you have this prince here, and he's actually, it's actually saying there that he's saying that he is God, number one, and yet he's going to be brought down before people. He's going to, people are going to see this guy being brought down. You say, well, it's just a prince of Ty or Tyrus there. That's all it is. It's just, it's just a political ruler. Keep reading. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You say, well, okay, it's the king, maybe the father of the prince of, of Tyrus. So you have the king of Tyrus, the prince of Tyrus, right? It's just a regular man. Keep reading. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Stop right there. Um, when was a king of Tyrus in Eden, the garden of God? Never. The Bible lists four different beings that are there in the garden of Eden. God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, Satan. So uh, it's either Adam or or God, or Satan. Can't be Eve, it's talking about a king. Um, who do you think it is? That would be Satan. Verse 13, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. He was created. He's a created being. Satan is a created being. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, remember that for later, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Read Revelation chapter 20 if you want where that's going to be fulfilled. Verse 19, All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. It's not just a king of Tyrus. This is the devil, very clearly. Well, then how in the world? How is it that Satan is called a king of Tyrus? Hmm. How, is it, how does that work there? Because Satan is a spirit that indwelled that king. That king had power and whatever else because of Satan. Satan has done this thing all throughout history. It isn't just some kind of a thing of, you fall down and worship me and I'll just kind of shake your hand and you can, you know, I'll just give you the, oh, here's some nice presents or whatever. And the Antichrist comes along, the beast, and, and the devil says, hey, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff there. He goes in to the Antichrist. He goes into these political rulers. I remember seeing a video years ago where the Pope Francis was, they, he just went into some kind of a trance just, you know, and people were just kind of looking at what's going on here and whatever else. Well, either the devil was entering into him or leaving. You know, probably left and there should have been a little sign on his head saying vacancy, you know. <laughs> but uh, show you another one. 
Isaiah chapter 14. Two books before Ezekiel. Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Has that happened? Yes. In recent history, actually, 1948, the Lord brought them again into their land. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them. In the, land, in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give them the rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. Again, study the book of Revelation. Babylon, Babylon. You know, the, the fall of Babylon and things all throughout the book of Revelation. You know, Revelation 14 talks about it. Revelation 18, of course, prophesies the whole thing. Revelation 17 talks about who the city of Babylon is. Revelation 18 shows the fall of the city of Babylon. Great merchandise, gold and precious stones and all the other things there that Babylon has. And they're brought down and they're burned with fire. Everything ties together. Okay? Okay. The king of Babylon, that's going to be the Antichrist, I believe. The beast in the future with the devil as the spirit that it's, that's indwelling him. They worship the dragon and they worship the beast and they say, who is like unto the beast? Two separate persons and yet they're referring to the beast. It's getting through? I certainly hope so. Jump down to verse 12. The famous part of Isaiah 14 here. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Lucifer is the right term there. There is no word star. If you want to get into the Greek and the Hebrew and whatever, well, not the Greek, but the Hebrew, the kokab is the word for star, and there's no kokab in this passage here. So you can't say morning star like the NIV does. They actually make Jesus the one that gets kicked out of heaven here. No, Lucifer is the right one. Okay? Talk about that here in just a minute. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Uh, stars of God there is reference to the angels, by the way. Um, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will also ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most Hi, what did we read over there in Ezekiel chapter 28 about the prince of Tyrus? He's saying, I am a God. I sit on the throne, you know, and, and on the seat and whatever else. It all ties together, you see. Remember the Lord saying, I'm going to kick you out of my holy mountain? Right there, the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. Hmm, all ties together. Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Tied in with Ezekiel 28. Tied in with Daniel chapter 10. It's all right there. Prince of Persia. Prince of Tyrus. King of Babylon. King of Tyrus. The devil's been doing this down through the centuries. His spirit goes in and indwells. He enters into these politicians. And he will enter into the Antichrist in the future. He gives him his power, his seat, great authority, and a mouth speaking great things. The Antichrist is going to be a great orator. Hmm. Now we're going to talk about the Satanic Trinity. Okay? What I'm going to do here, I'm not going to try to draw the trichatra thingy because that thing is, I can never draw it, make it look great. But what we'll do here, for the sake of the drawing this thing, I'll just draw a triangle because they like that too. Okay, and up here at the top, I'm going to put the Holy Spirit. Okay, and down here I'll put um, the Son 
And over here, the Father. Now, I didn't discuss this in the other study there about which one is which. Because I just kind of said, well, you know, I don't really know. I mean, uh, Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth. Let me just grab it here quick off the bookshelf. They have in here, see if I can get to the page quick. Um, they have in here things a little bit different. I thought, well, it doesn't sound right. And I just kind of thought, well, here you have page 123 right there. And it says the Satanic Trinity. Right there you see it. And down here at the bottom, you can see what he has. Okay. And he says, the dragon is the anti-God, the beast is the anti-Christ, and the false prophet is the anti-spirit. Wrong. Okay, it doesn't even work out that way. And you can, you know, it's just, again, it's kind of a matter of common sense when, you know, the Lord shows you this whole thing here, that that doesn't work out. Uh, Ruckman, in his book, The Mark of the Beast, he has it wrong as well. And I'm not trying to say, oh, look at me or whatever else. It's just, you know, think about this. We already proved who the spirit is. Okay. This spirit here, we'll say un, unholy spirit there, UN, you know, get that. We'll let that go. Um, the spirit there is obviously Satan. Okay? Who is the son? Well, you have the son of perdition, being one of the titles of the Antichrist. He is a false Christ, an anti Christ. So, pretty clear here. The Son is the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit there, the unholy spirit, the spirit of this uh, satanic trinity, the spirit is Satan. That leaves only one other possibility here. Who's the Father? Well, what is the Greek word? Greek word for Father is Pope. You say, well, that, that, that's, just, that's just your interpretation. That's just, that's just your way of saying things. And, and uh, you, just, you hate Catholicism so bad that you're just trying, to, just trying to frame them and make them look bad and whatever else. Well, that's not exactly true. And by the way, when I say I hate Catholicism and I do hate Catholicism, it doesn't mean that I hate Catholic people. All right, I don't hate Catholic people. Uh, let's see, where's that page at? I'm trying to find where the page is. All right, found it. Had to take a minute there. The title Pope, Greek for Father, is the most readily recognized of all the pontiffs' titles. Others include Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Jesus Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, primate of Italy, sovereign of the state of Vatican City, and servant of the servants of God. Okay? Let me just point to it here. Right there you have it. Can you read it? Right there. You say, what kind of anti-Catholic propaganda would that be? What kind of horrible Protestant book or something like that? Oh, just uh, the Vatican. Hmm. Very interesting. Written by uh, Father Michael Collins. Right there. A book that's actually promoting Catholicism. So don't tell me Pope doesn't mean Father. That's not true. Yes, it does. According to Catholicism. All right, so <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more here about this. Let me just kind of erase that a little bit so it looks better. Let me show you one other thing about this. Have you ever seen a symbol that looked kind of like this? I'm sure nobody's ever seen anything like that. <clears throat> Unless you have a dollar bill. <laughs> um, there's a certain organization out there who has a uh, square and a compass like that and a G in the middle for the God of their organization. And you know what these people want? <clears throat> they want 
They want above all things to have light. Hmm. And where do they get their light from? Lucifer, the light bearer. The loose, they're a god, Lucifer, these people over here that I won't dare name. Um, <clears throat> uh, they're interested in light and they want a certain spirit. You know why? Because they want power, great authority, and a mouth speaking great things. And who do they go to to get it? Or who do they go, who is the being that they go to in order to get these things? Satan, Lucifer, the devil. So how does the satanic trinity work out for the future? Very clear. The spirit there, I'll just go ahead and cross out holy. The spirit is Lucifer, the light bearer, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air, king over all the children of pride. The son of perdition, is the Antichrist. And he has, people that worship him are Antichrists. And the man that shows up in the future to help cause worship of this guy over here is the Pope. And their religion is mystery Babylon. Who infested the body of the king of Babylon? Lucifer. Becoming clear for you yet? I certainly hope so. There's no question about this whole thing. Um, there is a trinity coming up in the future, and it's not because, well, there's a satanic trin trinity, therefore it must be a counterfeit of the true trinity. Uh, no, there is no true trinity. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't say anything about a trinity. All right? Uh, the whole point is, which I said in the other study, the satanic trinity study, the whole thing is the devil cannot imitate what God can do. The Godhead is able to split into body, soul, spirit. They can split off. They can have conversations with each other without dying. If you split your body and your soul and your spirit apart, you're going to die, okay? Your body of flesh isn't going to be doing so good. You can't just do that. God can. So the only way that the devil can counterfeit this is by having three separate persons. And it's ironic, I'm going to show a picture here of one of the famous paintings of the Trinity in Catholicism, and you will see a dove at the very top, and there are light, uh, light rays, Lucifer, you know, light rays coming down onto the Son and onto the Father. I mean, right there it is. Okay, I showed the proof of that. So in the time of Jacob's trouble, the all-seeing eye here of Lucifer, which ironically the Antichrist is wounded in the eye, and he goes around for the rest of the thing with one eye. Nothing to it. But the Spirit gives power to the Antichrist and to the Father. He brings them light. He empowers them. It's a spirit there. And you see, you say, well, how's he going to control the whole world? Through the mark of the beast. That's another thing. People will be enlightened by the 6G technology, which I believe is going to be a big part of it there. That they're going to have, it's the integration of, of internet and, and your mind and everything else. It's just going to be tied into this grid. So you're not even going to have free will anymore. I believe that that is what the mark of the beast is there. That's why I believe people can't get saved when they take this thing, when they integrate into the system of the mark of the beast. They'll be illuminated into a satanic system that they can't get out of. Right? But now here's the key. This is where we're going to finish this study and go on to another part, another video. Here's the key. The devil, if he shows up as a red dragon here, well, it's going to be a little bit obvious. What's he going to show up as? He has to show up as a dove. The Bible says he appears as an angel of light, actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So what do most people think of when they see an angel? They think of white feathery wings. 
And so the devil, in his clever plan, he's already got Catholics thinking about what this guy's going to look like right here. You see the Jesus picture of the guy looking up to heaven and whatever else, or he's knocking at the door gently, you know. That's the Antichrist. I firmly believe that. The devil has been putting that into people's minds for thousands of years trying to get them ready for this whole thing. I shouldn't say thousands, but well over a thousand years. But what about the devil? How's he going to appear? I believe he's going to appear as a dove. All right. And that's going to be the next video. I'm going to show you from the King James Bible. And I'll just kind of break the, the little surprise here. The King James Bible says, well, I'll just, I'll do it this way. Like a dove. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. The Catholic Church says as, as a dove. Big difference. Okay. I'm going to show you the proof. I'm going to show you where it comes from in the Catholic writings and everything else. I'm going to show you that they're the ones that have been perpetuating this lie now for a long time. That the Holy Spirit is not like a dove. It doesn't descend like a dove. It's as a dove. Okay. I'm going to get into that more as we continue in the next study here. But you have to understand that this thing is extremely important. All right. This isn't just me railing on the Trinity again and whatever else. This is going to mean the difference between people being saved and damned eternally while walking this earth with no chance of salvation. You start to mess around. Let me just erase this here. You start to mess around. With this system right here in the future and you take that mark however it's going to look if it's going to be the you know trinity symbol thing my crude attempt there whatever the mark of the beast is going to look like you take that thing you're finished you're done that's why this subject is so very important to understand this system here this is going to damn more people than anything else in the history of man this is the most serious thing out there. Can't say that enough. Uh, that's why this study is very, very important. And uh, if this is the last study I ever do, let me just say that, I mean, if I'm not saying it's not going to be my last, but if this would be the last one, this is the one that you'd have to pay attention to the most for the future. Because there's going to be a lot of people that lis listen to this and watch this that are going to go into this time period here. A lot of people that aren't genuinely saved, they're going to go into this time period. And if you fall for the Trinity, which is going to be this whole system right here, you fall for it, you will be damned with no chance of salvation. Okay? So that's going to be it for this video. Next, we're going to show from Catholic sources, catechisms, books, writings of the Catholic Church, and the Reims New Testament. I got to have it down there. 1582, Reims New Testament, showing that they teach that the Holy Spirit is a dove. And yet you'll get Christian ministries doing the same thing today. Chick publications, others and things, and they show, they depict the Holy Spirit as a dove. Very, very, very serious. So please watch the next part, and uh, thank you for watching this one.